Children's Act 1998 is clear about protecting minors and acting in their best interest. Also, a Justice for Children policy launched in 2016 by the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection provides guidelines as to how the state should care for children. The policy also proposes the setting up of a fund to support children who are witnesses and victims of crime, including defilement. A child victim or witness compensation fund will be created within the proposed law for the state to support the needs and restoration of child victims and witnesses. The Ministry of Health will reduce barriers to children's access to medical care by establishing protocols and procedures for handling cases of victims of abuse, including sexual abuse, and build capacity amongst medical staff to follow such protocols, extending NHIS to cases involving child physical and sexual abuse, replicating the Child Abuse Protection Unit at the Kolibutichin Hospital in other regional and district hospitals. But it seems the bigger challenge is the actual implementation of these fine laws. But for the financial support from strangers, Angel wouldn't have been able to get the medical and psychological care she needed after she survived gang rape, and thus would have impeded her recovery. The social welfare department at Nkoko has so far been unable to offer any support to her. social welfare First, June, Hospital Kano. Any uh, police report on the Bamaya, Ninina Koye, nine hundred ninety Ghana, ninety Ghana, ninety Ghana, and nine million. Debbie Debbie, ninety Ghana, ninety Ghana, and Amumia Kotu and Rose or Drosto, Ebay, and also Koye, can I say? One point one. Which is 100, 110 Ghana cities. And you see two million. Okay. And you can see that 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 you can you can see that 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 you I your hand on Befra, posting in the back, a Befra, dear call, and teach you. And oh boy, eh? Oh boy, five hundred dollars. Boy, five hundred dollars. And I almost saw about Kunso, so my twenty million, or no dear, or no dear, near Hesica, twenty million, or no, no, say, I'm found call hospital, hospital. As for the two sisters, their dad believes they were denied a better medical care. Also, his inability to afford a psychological treatment for them has further impeded the girl's healing process. When we went to the hospital, um, I expected some injection to take place or something. And I know, the doctors know best. But what was given to us was an ointment, which should be used, applied to the place. This, this thing, I think it was an, it's an infe, a, internal uh, sore which need to be treated with some kind of maybe pills or injection or something like that. But this, nothing took place. And whenever we, we even go, um, that is what they give to us, yes. um, ointment. I don't know if we, uh, we are not approaching the best 
doctors or whatever, I don't know. Because we always go with this um, National Health Insurance card. And that is the implication or uh, impression that when you have a National Health Insurance card, you are not giving the, the best medication, especially the elder one. She behaves um, shy, she, she is very shy, she is dull in school, she is, she, she is never, um, she is still in the same class with the, 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 young, the, the younger one, in the same class. And if you call them for them to even read something, the, elder, the younger one will read everything and then the elder one is there. Poorly. It has affected her, you know, in, intimidation has, you know, um, made her, I don't know how to describe this, not coming out of her own self. Yeah. She's hiding within her. Beyond punishing offenders, the well-being of survivors should be of utmost concern. More than 1,900 cases of defilement was recorded by the Domestic Violence and Victim Support Unit, DOFSU, in 2015 and 2016. Majority of the victims were girls, with about 30 of them being boys. As survivors are physically and emotionally hurt from enduring such abusive acts perpetrated by adults they trust, experts say it is important to put a well-coordinated supportive system in place so as not to aggravate the pain sexually abused children are already experiencing. A child is defiled. The child is hurt physically. So bodily, you might have some damage done to the child. What we are used to is dealing with the bodily hurt, the physical damage that has been done to the child. So we we'll take the child to the hospital if she's fortunate or he's fortunate. And then we would have um, medical doctors attend to the child. That addresses the physical wounds. But the most debilitating wound is the emotional and psychological, which oftentimes we not address. You know, so yes, there are gaps, one, not understanding the child, and two, only addressing the physical wounds of the child. The most important thing is for us to have systems and structures that facilitate the full recovery of children. And I must say with a lot of pain in my heart that we don't have this in this country. Okay, um, so children who are defiled are left. I can cite an example for you to know what I'm talking about. Across all the uh, dimensions of the criminal justice system, from the police to the courtroom to the hospitals and all that, it is extremely important that we pay attention. This young child, uh, survivor of defilement, was sent to court and he, she had to face the perpetrator head on and she froze. She couldn't talk. What we call selective mutism. She muted and everybody was frustrated. Parents were frustrated. Judge was frustrated. And as a result of that, um, nothing was done. The parents were angry and abandoned the child at the court present. They were so disappointed having spent um, money commuting home, court, home court. And here was the child frozen in court. Couldn't give testimony, couldn't testify. And she's the principal witness here. What happened? What kind of support system do we have for children? Those who come into conflict or into contact with the law at the court place. Elsewhere, perpetrators don't face, uh, survivors don't face um, the, uh, the perpetrators in the courtroom. I must say that there have been improvement. Now, judges have been more, uh, more creative, more sensitive, and they are meeting them in their chambers. But we still haven't gotten there yet. We still haven't developed our systems to um, a level where we can really be sensitive, we can really be child-focused. When you go to Mexico, for instance, 
you know, there is everything is computerized. The child, the survivor doesn't have to repeat herself over and over and over again. They have a one-stop shop for uh, victims of uh, violence. So if a child, for instance, uh, was defiled and she went in there, there is a place for her to, there are social workers on hand, there are playroom, and they have some, uh, some video uh, software that interact with a child to take testimony with trained psychologies. You know, that helps in the child recovering. In our system, it isn't like that, okay? Uh, and so children are abandoned. Some even are not fortunate to really go to, uh, to get the, the, the even minimal help that we have for them, you know? And it has serious consequences for them. One thing that really also um, undermine the recovery of survivors, particularly children, is the narratives about the defilement, the narrative that people say, well, you are not believing the child, but you go on to say that, what did you go to do there? And all that really, really, really uh, undermined the full recovery of the children. The Department of Social Welfare has the mandate to provide social support services to these vulnerable boys and girls. The department is supposed to lead this crucial restorative process for survivors, but it is financially constrained, a situation which puts the future of these young ones at risk. We are going through challenges when it comes to funding. And then Koko case, I'm aware, the officers went there actually. And uh, sometimes if the funding is not forthcoming from the central government, we fall on NGOs. But sometimes too, there are NGOs, if certain NGOs are not operating in your area, it becomes difficult for them to actually assist. So you have to identify, it isn't all NGOs who are in that area. So if you don't get an NGO in that area of maybe child support and the rest, it becomes very difficult in getting. So these are definitely challenges because if the person will have to undergo skill training, if even in our institution, in our institution, definitely you need some funding to support the person. If it is not a, a, a residential institution, then it means even the transport to and from home to the institution also becomes a challenge. Uh, the Justice for Children Policy, for instance, talks about support for victims of said abuses and the rest. So until that fund is set in place, because if the fund is there, then you can quickly fall on the fund, draw some money to assist victims of such nature. We talk about uh, the child undergoing medical examination. And medical examination, it should be a thorough medical examination, not just going, they just examine, oh, there's nothing wrong. Because anything can happen. The child may contract even STD or whatever. So it means a thorough examination. And that will call for scanning, uh, lab tests, so on and so forth, which even if the child has NHIS scan, may not cover. So the setting up of the fund will go a long way in helping victims of uh, defilement. When it comes to counseling, we don't have enough. So it means you have to fall on private or government counselors. But how many two are they? You see, sometimes people say they are counselors, but you go deep into it, they are not doing the counselling. What they are doing is they are advising. So you have to be able to identify trained professional counselors. And they are also not going to give their services free. You also have to pay. Ideally, the process from the time a case of abuse is reported to the police through to the provision of social support for the victim must be seamless. In the first place, the, a defilement case will have to be reported to the police. And the police, during their investigations, uh, if they realize that the child, that is the victim, needs some support, then they will refer 
to the Department of Social Welfare. Actually, when it is reported to the police, the police, they also have the DOFSU unit. So they will also refer it to the DOFSU unit for the DOFSU unit to handle. And uh, when you visit most of the police stations, there is a collaboration. I mean, a good working relationship between the social welfare officers and the DOFSU officers. So most of the time when such cases occur, then they refer to the social welfare for them to also look at the psychosocial aspect of finding a solution to the problem. Then they, the police, will be carrying on with the criminal aspect of the problem. Having a dedicated fund to support survivors of defilement would help a great deal. At present, the Domestic Violence Fund, which is supposed to support medical bills of victims abused by family members, is said to have run out. Also, the proposed Victim Witness Compensation Fund is yet to be set up because the Children's Act and the Juvenile Justice Law are in the process of being reviewed and are expected to align with the recommendations of the Justice for Children policy. This 15-year-old girl, whom I call Alberta, opted for an all-girls senior high school. She made this choice because she grew up detesting boys and men. Alberta was defiled when she was only six, an experience that left the little girl frightened and traumatized. That day I closed from school and mommy had to get the library for us in one of the rooms in the house. So I was in the library taking a book when my sisters were in the porch. So as I was taking the book to read, he came inside the room. And mommy had told us that if we are somewhere and a man comes there, and, and when we are alone, we should get out of the place. So I was trying to get out of the room when he pushed me on the bed when it happened. My husband and I, we had a school. So I went in for this girl who also had a similar defilement issue, but the parents never followed up. They rather reframed her as she being the bad girl. So I decided to take her up, help her through her education. And when I brought her home, I was talking to her to build that kind of confidence and trust in her so that she can be open to me. We could live like a mother and daughter thing. So in talking to her, she told me how her experience was, and I was ready to make a follow-up to trace up to know who this man is so I could lodge a complaint and this man will be arrested. So after having that chit chat with her, the next day they all went to school with my children and uh, when they came back, she was narrating her story to my children as to how I came, how she ended up with me. So my daughter also in turn told her her experience with the boy we have took in as our son. It all happened I was inside and this girl walked to me and she called me mommy. I responded and she said, do I remember I told her that we should not hide anything from me? I said, yes. That's your daughter? No, the girl okay. I brought in. Okay. And I said, yes. She said, uh, but something terrible is happening. She doesn't know whether she had to tell me or not. I said, she should feel free and tell me anything. And I said, mommy, the story I told you about me being defiled some years back, do you know it has happened to your daughter too? I asked which of them, she said, the senior one. I was like, really? He said, yes. How did it happen? And he narrated it, that she said, uh, they actually have a library in our house. So she said she was with the other sisters. They were in the porch playing and she was in the library looking for some storybook to read. This guy, it's no more with us. Since my children started growing up, we dispatch of all the boys around. So she, they come to visit and go. So according to her, he came one time to visit. I was in the office, the daddy was also in the office. So he... Was the office in the house? Or? Yes, because we have the school in our house. Okay. Yes. So he said the boy came to meet her alone in the library 
and uh, there is a bed also there. It's more or less like a, a guest room and there is another room attached to it, which is the library. Then she pushed her on the bed and whatever happened, happened. In fact, I, I am one person who is so close to my kids and this um, defilement and rape thing, it's something I started teaching them how men make advances at, at small girls, even grown-ups. I tried to teach them so they could see the sign. I tried to let them know that the people who defile or rape us are people who are very close to us, our teachers, our pastors, our brothers, our fathers. So in actual fact, this one hits me like something. It's not as if they are ignorant and I've never taken any, any step to teach them or alert them or for them to see any signs about this thing. So to me, it was a blow why my child could not confide in me to tell me what happened until this new other girl I brought into the house had to come to and she being the one to alert me that this happened. I was really scared. I didn't know how to, how to talk to mommy because he, he told me not to tell anyone because if I tell anyone, he would hurt me. And I was really scared because maybe I might be sent somewhere to go and buy something and then he may see me and then do something to me. So I didn't tell mommy about it because I was scared. During the week before me getting to know of all this, I've been hearing my daughter say, he mentioned his name and said, you, you are my number one enemy in this world. But I, I was thinking, you know, kids play, joke around. So I thought maybe he's just done something, not knowing that weekend I traveled. And he said he was lying in a couch in the hall. And the boy come, came to touch her breast here and there. And even that, I, I still can't tell why my daughter could not tell me that this is what the boy has been doing to him. But I constantly hear her say, you, you are my number one enemy in this world. I hate you so much. After that incident, I wasn't talking to guys. I, I, I hated them. I didn't like, even my daddy, I wasn't free with my daddy. I hated all men. I didn't like, even if I see a guy passing, I'll make sure I don't even go close. I, I didn't like the sight of them at all. <laughs> when, when I remember it, sometimes I feel like crying. I become so sad. It was a very terrible moment. I never thought it could happen to me. So anytime I remember, I feel so bad. Sometimes when I'm in class and a teacher is teaching, and he's like, who hasn't, who? It's here and then it's a virgin, like no man has done anything with you. Then I can't, like they raise up their hands that they, nothing has happened to them. Sometimes I don't even know what to do. I become sad. Like sometimes I feel like, so am I the only one in this world meant, to, meant for that thing to happen to? I feel so sad and so lonely because most of my friends, they raise up their hand, they are virgins, nothing has happened to them before, they are free, so I'm the only one. It feels bad. Alberta's abuser, who happened to be a boy her parents had taken into their home, was jailed. The mom refused to yield to pressures from family and friends to drop the case. The incident, according to her, played a key role in divorcing Alberta's dad. But Alberta turned out to be bold speaking out about her ordeal in an attempt to prevent it from happening to other girls. Before I wasn't, but now I'm free to discuss with the people. If you tell me maybe it has happened to you, I, can, I will also talk to you about mine and advise you not to do what I did by keeping it in me. I'll advise you to tell your parents about it so they'll follow up and then arrest you. Actually, I didn't like talking about it. So when mommy started talking about it and I realized I was not the only one who it had happened to, it had happened to so many people. So I felt like, okay, it has happened to people, so I'll take it as it's, it's normal, it happens. I'm not the only one. So I just decided to take it to school. We have a school, my daughter is in the school, the boy also was a driver in the school. So definitely, people will be asking where is he that because all the time he's been with the police 
where we see rumors will be going around. I don't know how my daughter will feel, will be feeling uncomfortable and could not concentrate on her studies. So I decided to take her around to talk to other girls for them to know what has happened so nobody will have the chance to gossip about her so she can also move freely among her peers. I started from P1, from P1 to J3 as at that time. And in P1 class, surprisingly, I had about six girls in that class who was defiled. It's not every mother who would do that because the other girl, her parents didn't pay attention to it. But my mother, because of how much she loves me, she took the risk and arrested him. She wanted to make sure that nothing like that would happen to me. And I know that she was very hurt because I didn't tell her about it. And she was so hurt that it happened to me. When she's about going to secondary school, she insisted she would only go to a girl's school because she doesn't want to mix up with boys. Only God knows why and which I am sure it's because of this thing. So if this effect is coming up now, only God knows the future. I even, the, one of the uncle has helped, we've seen a psychologist, they've talked to her, they are still doing it now. But if up to now, it's so difficult for her to get over it, I don't know what, uh, what will happen to the others that have, we have pushed them in a corner somewhere, nobody is talking about it. Ghana, according to Adolf Bekwe, cannot have its girls abused and abandoned. Pedophiles are are wash in our country. We don't even know. They are wash everywhere. You know, the coastal area. Boys are defiled, left, right and center. There is so much stigma that they can't even come out. And yet we say they are our future leaders. Are we serious? Do we really mean well? You know, um, the Department of Children and the Ministry for Gender Children, I mean, what is happening to them? They are even completely out. A lot is not being done about children in this country. It is sad that um, we don't go to enough distances to protect children and let them feel that they, they have a state that, that uh, uh, has their interest at heart. Children are very important in a country with assault. Must be seen doing more for children who are hurting and children survivors of abuse are hurting, they must be attended to. I urge all, and one thing I want to tell them, I want to tell uh, survivors of um, defilement that there is life beyond the pain that you've been through. There is life beyond the disbelief. Society se seems to be letting you down, but it is still possible to pick yourself together through help, particularly for significant others. Believe your children when they tell you this has happened. It is very important that we believe them. So, whether or not parents can afford expenses, that come with getting best medical and psychological treatment for their girls, the state has a responsibility to support the restoration of survivors for the sake of their future and for the sake of the future of this country. So you know where your uncle is now? Yes. Where is he? He's at the police station. Police station? So how do you feel about that? Do you feel pity for him or you think he should go he deserves to be arrested for what he did? Yes. He deserves to be arrested. It's not my fault that I was a victim of defilement. And that I should I shouldn't um, allow it to kill my soul. I should still come out, be bold and be who I want to be in the future. I shouldn't let what has happened to me haunt me forever. I was just going to call Dr. Nguyen and I was going to call him. 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 I was going to call him.